copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Southgate police calling all cars. This is all cars broadcast 264 regarding the missing person. Be on the lookout for Dorothy Nelson. Described as middle aged, medium build, fair complexion. That's all. <laughs> work, ever call for the cooperation of other women and experience the grateful satisfaction of their loyalty. You men have at times been dependent upon other men who owed you no definite obligation, but whose sense of sportsmanship and fairness has renewed your confidence in your fellow men. I find myself in that situation. I have asked those who have listened to and enjoyed calling all cars to show their appreciation in the first and only test of listener loyalty we have ever made on this program. I asked if during the month of December... Every one of you would make one stop at a Rio Grande station, would tell your dealer you enjoyed the program, and buy a quart of Rio Lube or some cracked gasoline. The amount didn't matter. Well, your friendliness and graciousness was a new experience for me in my 14 years in radio. Our independent dealers have written and phoned in their appreciation. We thank you sincerely. All of you who have repaid our many calls into your homes and trust that tomorrow or during this weekend... Those of you who have forgotten will call at your Rio Grande dealers and help us assure you of another year of 52 Calling All Cars programs. The story we are to hear tonight has been taken from the confidential files of the police department of Southgate. We have therefore asked Chief Willard D. Brett to open our program. Chief Brett. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure again to appear on Calling All Cars. Southgate is not a city in which crime is a major problem, but like all communities, it has its crime solution problems. It is fortunate that our department is able to secure the speedy and complete cooperation of the Office of the Sheriff of Los Angeles County, as well as the cooperation of other nearby police departments. We have, therefore, little difficulty in proving to the criminally inclined that crime is a very unprofitable occupation in the city of Southgate. There has not been many murders committed in Southgate, nor for that matter, very many other felonies. But whether it's murder or petty theft, we are ready to pe prove beyond a shadow of doubt that crime of any sort does not pay. Our story opens in El Dorado, Kansas. October 21st, 1936. Oh, Phyllis, what's wrong? Uh, what do you mean, Mother? The days you've been thinking about something, something you seem to want to talk to me about, but you haven't. What is it? It's, it's about Dorothy. Has something happened to her? Well, that's just it. I don't know. It's just a presentiment, a premonition. Uh, what makes you think something's wrong? I don't know exactly. Phyllis, is this the premonition? Or have you something more definite than that? Frankly, Mother, I think I have. I didn't want to upset you, but I've been worried for quite a while. But why? Dorothy's written to us regularly. That's just it. Those letters don't sound like Dorothy. They don't sound like her husband, either. 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 Oh... I, I think you're just imagining things. No, I'm not. Look, Mother, Dorothy used to send you some little thing every time she wrote. Yes, she was such a thoughtful child. Dorothy wasn't a child, Mother dear. She's 40 years old. I'm afraid she was... Well, I'm afraid something happened. But what could happen to her? Plenty to a woman who thought as she did. We were a great deal closer than most brothers and sisters are, Mother. She told me things she never told anyone else. I don't understand you, Philip. Mother, Dorothy has an almost uncontrollable suicidal urge. Almost mania. She never told me that. She never told anyone that. I discovered it myself quite by accident. We were reading one night. That is, she was reading to me. It was some of Elizabeth Browning's poem. I thought once how the aperture had sung of the sweet years, the dear and wished for years. Who, each one in a gracious hand, appears to bear a gift for mortals, 
old or young. And as I mused it in his antique tongue, I saw in gradual vision through my tears the sweet, sad years, the melancholy years, those of my own life, who by turns had flung a shadow across me. Straightway I was where, so weeping, how a mystic shape did move behind me and drew me backward by the hair. And a voice said in mastery while I strove, Guess now who holds thee. Death, I said. But there the silver answer rang. Not death, but love. Not death, but love. Oh, sometimes the utter futility of everything gets the better of me, Phil. I feel I've been cheated. Terribly cheated. Oh, don't feel that way. I can't help it. You've got lots of things to be proud of. Don't say it, Phil. Don't say it, please. I couldn't stand it tonight. Look, why don't you try to tell me about it? I can't. I can't tell anyone. You can always tell me. I'll always understand. Yes, Phil. I, I think you would. I think Elizabeth Browning must have felt as I do sometimes. Remember that sonnet? If you must love me, let it be for naught except for love's sake only. Do not say I love her for her smile. Her look, her way of speaking gently. See, that's how I feel. I know I'm not pretty, I'm not attractive like other girls. And I'm old, Phil. So old. Nonsense. Why, you're old. Oh, don't. Don't enumerate the years. I don't think I can stand. I don't think I can stand any more of it. I knew all along how she felt, Mother. That was why I was glad when she married that kid out in California. He was much younger than she. She was almost twice as old, but she was grasping at what seemed to her a last chance of happiness. Don't you see, Mother? Yes, Phil. I do see. I've sensed the undertone of unhappiness that Dorothy's always felt. I think her reason will keep her from doing anything rash. But that's the point, Mother. To her, it isn't rash. It's the logical thing to do. She has her painting. She can write. But she feels she's been cheated. She feels that she has a right to take this course. Then you're sure something has happened to her? I'm positive. I'm going to ask the police to investigate. A few days later, Chief Brett received a letter in Southgate. He immediately conferred with Captain Gutty of the Detective Bureau regarding the missing Dorothy Nelson. You know, Chief, I've been thinking about those letters that fellow sent us from Kansas. What about them? Remember the one we know definitely was written by a woman? Yes. Well, that one was well-written and well-typed. All the others were misspelled and had a lot of mistakes in them. I noticed that. Personally, I think that fellow Sloan got something to worry about. Well, we'll soon find out. This looks like the address the brother gave me in his letter. Neat bunch of bungalows, anyway. Not much chance of anything happening around here without the neighbors knowing about it. I'm depending on that, too. Nothing like an observing neighbor to help on a missing person case. Might as well try the manager's office first. Might as well. You phoned the sheriff's office, didn't you? Just before we left. Mahoney and Killian are coming down to get a line on the case. Wait a minute. Here comes the landlady. Yes? How do you do? I'm Chief Brett's police department. This is Captain Gooding. We're, uh... Oh, won't you come in? Thank you. Yeah. Now, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Uh, you're the manager here, Mrs., uh... Webb. Yes, I'm the manager. Uh, did you know a Mr. and Mrs. Nelson? Oh, yes, very well. They lived in the third bungalow. Have you seen Mrs. Nelson lately? Why, no, not for almost two months. Uh, what sort of woman is she? She's a very cultured, refined woman of about middle age, perhaps. About how old? Oh, I'd say around 40. Uh-huh. And uh, her husband is... Uh... Well, that's a very peculiar thing. He wasn't a day more than 21 or 2. Oh, May and December, huh? <laughs> yes. When did they move in here? In March of last year, I believe. I haven't seen Dorothy since the latter part of July. Know where she went? 
The last time I saw her, she seemed a little more worried than usual. And shortly after that, her husband said she was going back to see her mother in Kansas. Well, it's a since she didn't go there. Were you very friendly with the Nelsons? Oh, yes, I visited them often. Mm-hmm. Did she and her husband seem to get along very well? Well, yes and no. You see, they were kind of opposites. The kind of people who have to live together a long time before they really understand each other. What do you mean by that? I don't think Dorothy's marriage was the sort you'd expect a woman of her intelligence to make. She came from the arty set around Laguna in San Diego. She painted well, wrote poetry, was interested in intellectual things. Her husband was a sheet metal worker. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. No, but it hardly fitted him to mingle with the sort of people Dorothy called her friends. She has real talent. Someday I think she'll be a great poet. Mm-hmm. Did that situation... Uh... I mean, his not fitting in with her friends, did that ever cause any friction or trouble? Or... Well, I remember a party down at Laguna one night. We'd all driven down in Nelson's car. Dorothy's friends were having a wonderful time <laughs> reading each other's <laughs> back. Hello, Patricia. But, my dear, you must see Paul's new picture. It's called Halt Ascending Stairs, and it's positively oh, transcendental. Well, that monkey couldn't paint signs for a bulldog in tobacco. Oh, simply too ravishing. The bird flees through the ocean, and right in the center, two poached eggs. Oh, boy, did you so How do you like this, Mr. Nelson? Lousy. What did you say, dear? I said lousy. What is? This party. I think he's... It's a little out of his depth. Yeah, what makes you think so? Oh, well, Dan's always so bored with this sort of thing. He, he likes to be doing things. Sure. He wants to sit around listening to a lot of trash like the guff these birds dish out. Come on, let's shove off there. Go. We can. We've got to stay in here some of Berglaw's new floor. Oh, for God's sakes, have we got to? Yes, dear. Now, please, please, try to look pleasant. Make out like you like it. Yeah, fat Quiet, cats. quiet, everybody. Here it comes. Now, I promised you that Paul would read some of his latest things for you tonight. Come on, right on, Kippo. And the first is dinner in the Latin Quarter. Oh, now, quiet, yeah. everyone. Yeah, I bet this is the <laughs> Crisp white onions, like virgins going to communion. I love them. Robelasian bread, meal mixed with barley, luscious brown beans drooling in their liquor. Oh, oh, oh. How do you like that? Like a meal in a chili joint. Strikes me you don't approve of all this. No, I'd rather go to a movie. Dorothy, Dorothy, it's your turn. Well, uh, if you don't mind... Now, I'll now, now, nonsense. Your village blacksmith can spare you for a few moments. How'd you like a good sock and a puss, punk? Uh, come along, Dorothy. Are we going to have to urge you, dear? No, no, I, I just suddenly feel very tired and a little embarrassed. As a matter of fact, I didn't bring anything with oh, me. Oh, that's true. What are you talking about? You give them to me just before we left the house. Oh, yeah. Here they are. No, Dan. Go on, read them. No, I, I'd rather not if you don't mind. Oh, what the heck? I'll read them. Oh, splendid. Dan. 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 No, Dan, please. Oh, no, Dan. Please, Dan, no. Perhaps this is not my life's throbbing hunger, being fed delicately, or my congen congenital dream being passionately fulfilled. But yet, night and darkness clothe my strong-armed lover with beauty and power. If I can keep him silent, my hands leap out to touch lithe muscles of his firm young arms. He can be Tristan then, or Lancelot. And I, the dark Elaine, tenderly, too, he takes my hands and puts them to his cheeks. I feel the smoothness of his youth, and then I become chillingly what I am, something old, hungering, hungering for a dream. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I dropped my cup. Things were a little strained after that, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I, I think I do. Have you uh, seen this guy Nelson lately? Not since the middle of August. He moved shortly after Dorothy left. Took everything with him, I suppose? Yes. Everything except a few notes in some of her poems. He never seemed to care about them. Of course, I rented the house again. Uh, mind if we look at the notes he left here? Not at all. I have them right here in the desk. Hmm... If this is any sign, she simply pulled up stakes and left him. What are you talking about? Listen to this. 
The shadow of the uncertain, uh, the shadow of the certainty of parting falls across my heart as poignant and as sure as the shadow of the night lies athwart the world in its brightest of days. Now, let's keep going. You said you were happy and drunk on the cup of life that I brought. I, uh, gratified, spilled it all for you, forgetting I was taught maxims in frugality's praise. Now I withdraw the cup, shall you recall the fragrance of the wine, and, forgetting or remembering, know the cup you held was mine. Concise and to the point. Hmm. Mrs. Webb, do you mind if we look around a bit? Not at all. Thank you. By the way, why didn't you talk to Mrs. Huge? She lived next door to the Nelsons. It's the fourth house. We'll do that. Thanks. Well, what do you think? I don't know. I'm wondering why a woman like that compromised with her real self when she married that kid. My friend, don't get started to wondering why women do things. You'll go nuts. At my age, you're telling me. I wonder why Mrs. Webb thought we ought to talk to this Mrs. Huge. Mm, watch yourself, Chief. This isn't any compromise with her better self this time. Mrs. Webb had some definite reason for that suggestion. Never can tell. Well, here's the place. Oh, she's home. I wouldn't like to make another trip out here just to hear a bit of neighborhood gossip. Oh, uh, good afternoon. How do you do? Uh, we're from the police department. Oh. And Mrs. Webb thought you might have some information about the Nelsons that we could use. Oh, well, perhaps. Uh, oh, won't you come in? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, oh, excuse me a minute, but I have a cake in the oven. Uh, just make yourself at home, gentlemen. Go right ahead. Don't worry about us. I wonder if she spends a lot of time in the kitchen because she's inclined that way or because the kitchen looks out on the driveway. And most of the coming and going is on the driveway, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> now then, gentlemen, you're uh, looking for the Nelsons, is that it? That was the general idea. Mm, well, now, let me see. Uh, I guess it was around the 1st of August the last time I saw Dan Nelson. Oh, no. No, I believe it was. Uh, what was he doing when you last saw him? Why, uh, he was... Uh, Oh, no, he wasn't... Yeah, no, 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 that was the first time well, I... Well, it really doesn't make much difference right now when it was, now, does it? Well, I guess not, really. Well, anyway, I was standing in the kitchen one morning. Oh, I spend a lot of time in the kitchen. Uh, see so much, you know, and get so much done. Yeah, I noticed. Well, on this particular morning, I saw Mr. Nelson come out of his house and start dragging a trunk off to the garage. Good morning, Mr. Nelson. Uh, are you moving? No, not exactly. I'm just storing some things for Dorothy. Oh, is she gone? That's right. I hadn't seen her around for the last few days. Yeah, she went to San Diego to work for some friends of hers. Oh, what doing? Now, this man and his wife, they're going to open a stamp store. Oh? Dorothy's always been interested in things like that. Uh -huh. She's going down there to help them out. Well, oh, my goodness, but that looks like an awfully heavy trunk. Uh, why don't you let Mr. Hughes help you carry it out to the garage? No, I can handle it. Don't bother him. Then he put the trunk in the garage and locked the door. Well, what's so peculiar about him locking the door? Well, he never did it before. And besides, it was a new lock. Did you see Nelson after that? Yes, I saw him, uh, oh, three or four days after that. He was out in the garage again, trying to load the trunk on his car. He had the motor running. Oh, you -hoo. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Are you having trouble? No. Uh, do you need any help? No. Uh, Mr. Hughes will be very glad to help you load it on. Uh, wait a minute. I'll turn on the back porch light so you can see better. Never mind. I don't need no help. Oh, Homer won't mind a bit. I tell you, I don't want no help. Now, let me alone, will you? Well, you can imagine how dumbfounded I was when he rushed off like that. Yeah, we can imagine. Uh, let's take a look at that uh, garage. Oh, you can go through the kitchen if you won't walk too heavy. My cake is baking, and it's my fault if you jarred it. Well, we'll try to walk softly. Good. <laughs> Say, you have quite a view from here. You must see a lot. Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> oh, well, that's the Nelson garage right back there, the uh, center one. Oh, thanks. We'll look it over. Oh, good heavens, my cake. Well, that woman's given me a lot of strange ideas. Not so strange under the circumstances. That fellow Nelson must have been pretty upset about his wife walking out on him. I imagine he must have been. I wonder why Garage doors always squeak. <laughs> Adds a mystery, I guess. Musty place, isn't it? Hmm. Hey, look. Take a close look at this. What is it? What do you think? I'd say it was penetrating oil. Well, that's what it looks like. 
But I'll bet a good chemist and a benzidine outfit will prove we're both wrong. Meantime, deputies Mahoney and Killian worked on the meager information relayed by telephone from the letter of Philip Sloan. Chief Brett had given the contents of the letter to Captain Penfraze of the Sheriff's Office, together with his own conclusions. And from this information, the deputies had learned much. They conferred with Chief Brett and Captain Gutting. Well, Chief, Killian and I have found out a little about your Nelson family. That's fine. We've been getting a few ideas ourselves. We've got a man making chemical tests out at the Nelson place now. Mahoney and I took a run down to Laguna before we came over here. It seems a Sloan woman picked the Nelson kid up on the highway one day, down close to San Diego. The first thing anybody knew, they were married. Seems that she comes from a pretty wealthy family, which probably explains his interest in a woman twice his age. Yeah, it usually helps in explaining such things. He married this monkey in 1934, sometime in the fall. And he was still in service and just came home weekend. Yeah, seemed to get along all right till he overheard somebody call him a jiggler one night down Laguna. <laughs> That's how the fight started. Yeah, he raised such a row with his wife that some friends of hers used a little pressure to get him transferred to Hawaii. shanghai him, huh? Practically. Well, she wouldn't divorce him, though, in spite of all her friends. Nelson came back in 1935, and he was discharged a few weeks afterward. Now, that's when the trouble really started. When she started trying to housebreak him, huh? Yeah. yeah he didn't <laughs> mix well with the Laguna crowd. Yeah, so we've heard. Boy had a pretty bad background. i run in for stealing a couple of times while he was in high school. The kids in school got sore at him for that. Yeah, that's why he joined the service. But he failed to mention his arrest when he enlisted, I imagine. Probably. We found out he's got a brother working in an electrical fixture place on East 34th. Let's take a run over there and have a talk with him. Chief Bratz. Oh, it did, eh? That's what I expected. Thanks. That was our chemist. The benzabine test showed that the spot in the garage was blood. Well, how about that penetrating oil? Somebody tried to cover up the blood. You're Mr. Nelson? Yeah. Yeah, Dell Nelson. You sent for me? Yes. We're making a check on a car that's supposed to be registered to your brother. Know where he is? Why, no. Didn't he make that payment like he said he would? Hmm? Uh, no, no, apparently not. Well, I don't know where you'll find him. I hadn't seen him. He told me he was going to Bakersfield. Said he had a boxing match lined up. Well, if you see him, tell him to get in touch with the finance company. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, by the way, where's he staying now? Well, he's living at the Abbey Hotel in L.A., I think. Well, we'll check in there just in case. Chief Bretts and his companion sped to the Los Angeles Hotel only to be told... No, Dan Nelson checked out of here two days ago, according to my record. Checking further on the Bakersfield angle, the officers found... Nope, there's no fight scheduled for tonight in Bakersfield. Positive that Del Nelson was lying to shield his brother, Bretts and the others returned to the 34th Street plant. You lied to us, Nelson. Why? Well, I, I... All right, all right. What is it? Well, uh, I wanted to protect him. Protect him from what? Oh, you can't fool me, Bretts. I know you. I know your coppers, all of you. Well, what about it? Well, Dan told me he was in trouble. That he had to leave town for a few days. What kind of trouble? He said his wife had threatened to commit suicide. She was going to do it so it looked like he killed her. He was afraid she'd done it. What made him think that? Well, she left him and he didn't know where she went. She got scared and beat it. You want to be pulled in, Nelson? No. No, please don't do that. It'll kill my mother. She couldn't stand it. I don't know anything about Dan's private life. I'm telling you the truth. We can take you in as a material witness, you know. Oh, please don't do that, Chief. Please. Take it easy. Where's Dan? I don't know, honest. All I know is I got a date to meet him at 34th and Santa Fe at 4.30. In just a few minutes. He said he wanted to talk to me. Okay, come on. You ride with Captain Gutting. We'll all keep that date. You and Mahoney keep a lookout on the other side of the street. I'll watch this side. We don't want that monkey to spot us first. How are we going to know him? Well, he looks exactly like his brother, and he's got big warts on his right hand. Now, that's the bird right over there by the telephone pole. The one scratching his chin? Yeah. That warts like toadstool. Okay, stay here. I'll go and get him. Waiting for somebody, Nelson? Yeah, I was. What's it to you? Your brother's in the car across the street. He wants to see you. What's Dell done? Nothing at all. We just thought we'd make this a sort of reunion down at headquarters. Headquarters? That's huh? right, headquarters. Police station to you. All right, Nelson, sit down. Dan, where's your wife? My wife? 
How should I know? That's what we're asking you. She went back home to Kansas. No, she didn't. We just happened to pick you up as a result of a letter we got from her brother. Come on, tell the truth. If she's not there, I don't know where she is. I hated her, and I hated the ground she walked on, and I still do. And what are you going to do about it? Tough guy, eh? So what? Tell him about the benzidine, Chief. Tests we've made in your garage, Nelson, show that there's blood all over the floor where a trunk sat for a week. Maybe you can explain that. Oh, the trunk, huh? Sure, I can explain that. I put a clothes in it and sent it home. You sent it home? What do you want to tell us things like that for? I meant I, I was going to send it home, but I didn't. I got to thinking about it, see, and I couldn't see any sense in being nice that way when she'd been the way she had, so I dumped it in the river and it washed away. How? Oh. How would it? Well, maybe you can tell us. Yeah, maybe you know how a trunk can wash away in a dry river. You know it hasn't rained in two months. Well, that's what I did with it. All right, Nelson. We've got as much time as you have. Smart guys, ain't you? Why don't you give me the third degree? What's the matter? Cat got your tongues? Well, say something. Go on, ask me questions. Why don't you say something? Okay. Have it your own way. What's it to me? I can sit here as long as you can. I can look at you, too, see? See me staring right back at you? I ain't afraid of you guys. You ain't got nothing on me. I guess a guy's wife's got a right to walk out if she wants to, ain't she? Well, ain't she? For God's sake, say something. Don't, don't sit there looking at me that way. Say something! nagging any longer, always wanting me to better myself, always wanting me to be highbrow. Sure, I killed her. I hated her, do you hear me? I hated her. And I'm not sorry. Go on, go ahead and hang me and get it over with. I like it. I'm not afraid. 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 In just a moment, we shall hear additional facts from Chief Brett. Before Chief Brett completes your story, I want to tell those of you who may have tuned in late that during the month of December, we are making a test of listener loyalty to this program. Will you promise yourself to stop at a Rio Grande station once this week to show your appreciation of calling all cars? It will constitute a Christmas gesture that I know you will be happy to make and will be most deeply appreciated by the cast, the sponsors, and me. And now, Chief Brett. Nelson whose name we have changed to protect his family from undue suffering, was tried for the murder of his wife. And though he fought with every means at his command, he was convicted. On December 30th, almost a year ago, he was sentenced to life imprisonment from Sam Quentin. He'll spend the rest of his life learning that crime does not pay. Thank you, Chief Brett. Southgate Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation of broadcast 264 regarding a missing person. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rolling. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsay, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present Murder at Sundown. This is the Columbia Broadcast.